Hey, how's it going, V1 Church? This is your lead pastor, Mike Signorelli. Can we greet each other in the comments right now? We got a live audience with us. Can we get loud here? <laughs> Come on, I want you to do something. I'm talking to my Facebook family because y'all are wild and you're watching from all over the world. Not only do I want you to comment, two weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, we had the most shared service ever. And I, our team was like dumbfounded. And you know what it was? I asked you to share. That literally was the only difference. So I'm believing right now that suicides can be canceled if you share. I'm believing right now that someone's spouse is going to hear from another room and get saved during this service if you share. I'm believing right Come on, I wish somebody would help me out. I'm believing that a share can actually produce the miraculous. Does anybody here believe that as well? Um, you know, listen, I'm doing all I can do. What I can do is preach this sermon, but what you can do is share it. So go ahead. Some of you on Facebook have the ability to share to 10 Facebook groups. Like, let's get banned we share so much. Like, let's make Mark Zuckerberg feel like, man, there's a disturbance in the spirit realm. Uh, these V1 church people are breaking every known system we have. Now, if you're on YouTube right now, I'm just still going to ask you to like. I want you to subscribe, but I want you to text this message to somebody. Because as we're going through this series, overwhelmed, this message has been stirring in my soul. And so let's go ahead and get rowdy. Don't Listen, turn your iPad up, turn your phone up, do whatever you've got to do to remove move distractions, put that do not disturb on. Do I have any watch parties right now watching? Come on, we can lift it up in Queens. We got Queens representing Long Island. And uh, today's going to be amazing wherever you're watching from. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, you have this picture of the birth of Christ. And then we have this famous Christmas story. It's the story of the three magi, the three wise men, whatever you call them in your culture, that go on this journey to actually uh, just pay homage and honor the Christ, the, the Savior of the world. And I want to I tell you about that story today because there's such a rich revelation that I got from this. I have never seen this before. I've heard this story. I've read it. I've preached it even from different angles and perspectives, but I've got a fresh word for somebody today. But I want to start by saying this. Okay, this is amazing. And this to me is like such a prophetic timeline that we're on right now. Did you know that tomorrow, yes, I'm talking tomorrow, if you go out into the night sky for the very first time in 800 years, Jupiter and Saturn are going to come into alignment and it's gonna be so bright that it is going to actually recreate. Now, I didn't, I didn't hear this from a preacher. I was, I'm a news junkie and I was actually reading a scientific journal and I saw this article and it blew my mind and the Lord immediately said, Mike, you all are on a prophetic timeline. Tell my people, listen to this. It is literally the Christmas star, the star of Bethlehem is returning tomorrow. I don't know if you guys knew that. So literally December 21st, Jupiter and Saturn align and they recreate, come on, they recreate the Christmas star in 2020. Now, let me just tell you, for those of you who don't understand history, go back 800 years, where are you? Guess what they called it in history 800 years ago? Man, I got chills all over me. Yeah, the Dark Ages. The last time this has occurred, it was the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. And so in the Middle Ages, over 800 years ago, you have these two planets align. It illuminates the night sky and you have the return of the Bethlehem star, the star that the same wise men follow. And then guess what? Tomorrow it comes back again. Why? Because we serve a God who will let things get real dark so he can put his power on display. We serve a, come on, I feel the power of God right now. Oh yeah, yeah, your marriage isn't going quite like how you imagined it. Well, guess what? The Bethlehem star returns, returns, returns. Come on, your business may be tanking through this pandemic. Well, guess what? The Bethlehem star returns. Here's the only question we've got to ask ourselves. Are you wise enough to fix your focus on that star? <laughs> Man, y'all don't understand. I'm about to take off running. I couldn't wait to preach this. You know what made them wise? There are a whole bunch of men who saw the star, 
but there are three of them who are wise enough to fix their focus on it. Come on, look up. You gotta, sometimes you gotta raise your chin up to get another altitude to change your attitude. And wisdom says, I'm gonna look up to the hills from whence my help comes. Come on, somebody, I'm preaching good. In the first four minutes, I, you got a word today because God wants to know who's wise among you. Have you fixed your focus on everything that's around you? Or do you see that Bethlehem star that's guiding you? And I, I was just like, God, surely during a global pandemic, surely during all of the political uh, uh, turmoil that we've went through around the world that this star would return. This star would return. Let me read the biblical account. So go ahead and open up your Bibles if you've got an old school Bible. Follow along on the screen. Do I have any note takers with me today? People who are hungry to learn? Matthew chapter two, verse one through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jer Jerusalem saying, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? What, who was born king of the Jews? Did you know that Satan knows how to read a seed? Can I just break that down for you? Because I, I, listen, when you know how to read a seed, you can look in your hand and say, oh, that, that is an apple seed that will eventually become an apple tree. Some of you are asking like, why has Satan fought me so hard? I haven't even wrote my book yet. Well, because he's reading the seed and says, that's an author and I've got to take them out before the book ever comes out. Oh, I wish somebody was with me. I wish I can get an amen in the comments right now. Satan knows how to read a seed and he'll fight you like you became the tree while you're still in seed form. See, the thing about Jesus, he was born the king of the Jews. He hadn't even died on the cross yet. But see, even Satan was able to recognize that looks like the savior. He's gonna, if, if I let him come into maturity, if I let him come into fullness, Satan fights fullness. He, he tries to stunt your growth. He, starts, he tries to stop you from germinating. And the very first assignment on Jesus' life came right after his birth because Satan knows how to read a seed. Look at this. It says, for, for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Watch this. This is the spirit of Herod. I believe that this spirit is still in operation today. Be, remember that the apostle said, for our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, Principalities powers, and rulers in high places. So behind Herod was what? I just got to go back and teach the basics because through this political season, the church has relearned how to hate people. <laughs> and so behind a person is a principality. Do you all believe that? And so it'd be easy to say Herod was a bad guy, but how many of you know that Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy? And so it'd be easy to say, well, that was just a Herod problem, but how many of you know the spirit behind Herod is still operational on planet Earth right now? Come on, abortion, that is the spirit of Herod. Come on, there, there is a spirit that says, I want to kill it before it comes into fullness. I want to kill it before destiny is realized. I want to kill it before accomplishment. And so Jesus had an assignment on his life for murder before he even was murdered. Before the cross, there was an assignment. Before there was destiny, there was an assignment of death. And I want you to see this with Herod. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Why? Because narcissists hate it when they are not the only object of worship. Satan was a narcissist and that got him kicked and expelled out of heaven. And when Herod said, wait a second, there's another king. I'm not the object of everyone's affection. Murder. The root of it was selfishness. I'm so thankful for the Christmas season because it's one time a year where we try to get outside of ourselves to lavish others with gifts. But how many of you know that generosity is the language of the kingdom? For God so loved, he gave, he bankrupted heaven to give his son. And so even God said, I'm going to give and be generous. But Herod said, I'm controlled by an opposite spirit. I want to receive. I want to receive worship, adoration. There's only room for one king in this kingdom and it's me. And this is what he said. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Christ that was to be born? Now watch this. I just want to stop there because we read the Christmas story so fast and we've kidified it. And if you've got some children watching right now, I'm just, how many of you know our kids want to actually eat some solid food of the word as well? 
right? We have like really diminished the strength of what's in the word. And we've got children who want to, let me just stop at that sentence. Verse four, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where is the Christ that was to be born? And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. Watch this. They knew the word, but they didn't have a prophetic ear to hear that there was a demonic spirit behind Herod. So they quoted the scriptures back to Herod, but revealed the location to murder their Messiah. That's deep. That's deep. And in this season, there's a lot of preachers. There's a lot of pastors that can quote the word, but don't have a listening ear to hear what the spirit's doing in this season. And some of us have to really pray, God, open up our ears. They willfully gave up Jesus' location, but quoted scripture while they did it. Isn't that just like the spirit of religion? <laughs> Literally help you cancel someone else's destiny, but you do it in Jesus' name. <laughs> come on, you use scripture to talk about, come on, to partner with the enemy. There's been a lot of that happening. But see, there was wise men. Do I have some wise men and women that are watching this broadcast right now? Do I have some people with wisdom in their heart? The wise men, may I submit to you, without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, had enough wisdom to know that God was working. And they begin to move in the direction of this star. They begin to move in the direction of this sign that was unto them that the Savior was born. Let me skip down to verse 7. When Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained for them what time the star had appeared in verse eight. And he said to them in Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Come on, Herod, you are lying. You don't have any intentions to worship him. Now look. But this is, and after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It is possible for Satan to have a strategic plan to cancel your destiny, but still choose to have exceeding joy and rejoice in the midst of it. There could be a plan that the enemy's working in and around your life, but you're still getting ready to shout because you know that when it's dark, the light shines brighter and God's still on the move. Come on, these wise men said, hey, we know what Herod's doing. We're not gonna give up his location, but we know what God's doing too. And I wanna shift your focus. I want to fix your focus on this star of Bethlehem that declares that God has a plan in the midst of everything we're going through. Does anybody believe it? Yeah. Come on. It says this, then summon Herod the wise men secretly. And then he goes through verse nine and they begin to rejoice. They get on location. Verse 10, when they saw it, they rejoice. Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, watch this. When then opening their treasures, come on, somebody say their treasures. Fear will always cause you to focus on what you don't have, but faith will cause you to focus on the treasure you do have. See, right now, it'd be real easy to focus on what you don't have. I don't have enough to give my kids. I don't have enough in this season. It's like fear will cause you to focus on what you don't have. But the faith of the wise men caused them to focus on the treasure that they did have. Hey, do you have myrrh? Oh, no, I don't have any myrrh, but I have frankincense. Okay, take your frankincense. That's the treasure you do have. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody today. What do you have? One had frankincense. One had myrrh. Come on. And so they begin to bring the treasure that they have. You know, it's a powerful story. We were doing a broadcast weeks ago, and I believe that God was going to break a spirit of depression over those who are watching. As a matter of fact, multiple people messaged our church and said that they canceled suicides as the result of that broadcast. Well, I had taken a screenshot of one young woman's story, and I shared it to my Instagram stories. After I shared it, and this is crazy, guys. Listen, this story is amazing. After I shared it, a guy reached out to me who I've never met in person. 
And he said, Pastor Mike, I feel moved to give this woman some money for Christmas, but I don't want her to know that I'm giving it. Can I give it through the church? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Like, here's the giving link. I'll, I'll connect with this woman. So I hit her up and I said, hey, we want to give you $200 for Christmas. Well, she starts crying immediately. She's like, this is amazing. She's sending me voice memos, videos. She's like, you have no idea. And what she said was, the reason why I wanted to kill myself was because I have two young boys and I wasn't able to provide Christmas for them. So I had received the deliverance from that depression and that spirit that was over me trying to end my life. But then after that, you said you're going to give. So I went back to the guy and said, hey, that $200 that you said you want to give, here's the result of it. And he said, hey, I'm really convicted. I said, why? And he said, because God actually told me to give 500. And he said, so I'm going to give the other 300. So I hit her back up. I'm like, yo, it's 500. So now she's wrecked. All of a sudden, the next day, the guy hits me up and he said, I learned an important lesson about bringing what I have in faith. I gave 500. The next day, I made $15,000 unexpectedly. $15,000 completely. Now, that's what I call multiplication. And so if you're focused on what you don't have, well, I can't bring well, what I really want to bring to this baby. You know, that's what I'm saying. This is the Messiah. What I really want to bring to him is gold. Well, but I don't have gold, but I have frankincense. And see, bring what you do have. And see, he brought the $500 he did have. And then God said, okay, here's 15,000 back. And see, there's something about a multiplication that happened. See, what happened with these wise men is they followed the star. They didn't follow their fear. They followed the bright and shining sign that was in the heavens. They, they had their eyes fixed on, they were heavenly minded. They were looking into the spiritual realm saying, I know that that star's not there by an, an accident. It's time for me to lavish my love upon the Savior. And whatever I do have, that's what I'm going to give. That's what I'm going to give. Whatever I do have. Come on, I know this message is helping somebody today. I know this message is helping somebody. And so it says this in verse 12, and being warned in a dream, a prophetic dream, come on, not to return to Herod. They departed to their own country by another way. They departed to a country, their country by another way because God had intervened. See, I've heard so many countless stories of people getting vivid dreams through this season. And you know what? Sometimes God will speak to you in your unconscious mind because you ignore him in your conscious mind. And so if God's giving you prophetic dreams, I dare you to talk to him while you're awake because he's trying to speak to his people. You know what I see? I see a star. And guess what? Tomorrow on the 21st, the whole world's going to see the star of Bethlehem. I, seen a, I see a sign from God that he's saying, who are the wise ones? Who are the ones who are going to rise up? Who are the ones who are going to stand up in faith? Because guess what? These men, they had the details of their life. You don't know the to-do list of the three wise men, but you know the gift that they brought the Messiah. Because you want to build true legacy? Legacy is built through a gift, not a list. <laughs> And you have a list of all the things you want to get done, mom. Mom, I want to get done. You're saying, I want to get the laundry done. Christmas is coming. I want to get my house all together. I want to clean. That's great. You'll get that. Stop judging yourself and criticizing yourself based on your list and start building legacy based on your gift. God's got a gift for you to give the world. Come on. God's, God's trying to help you through this season to discover that legacy is always recorded when there is a gift. And you don't know these people's lives, but they pushed aside the smallness of their own existence and said, I'm not fretting over those details. There's something about looking to the heavens, the expanse of the universe that puts things back into perspective. You know, driving with my wife is so stressful on me because she gets lost the GPS. She, I don't know why, but her phone recalibrates every single time she's in. And my wife, have you ever looked at your Uber and you just see it spinning in circles on the map? It's like, I don't know if you guys have had that happen. It happens to me all the time. 
But the thing that's stressful is like you can't see the twists and turns because you're on the ground level. But when you change your altitude, you look down and you say, wow, there's so much meaning to that mess now that I'm at a higher elevation. There's something about this star that's in the sky where God is trying to cause the people, get over how lonely you feel. I've given you the Holy Spirit and then I'll give you a mate later. Get over how much your husband's messed up. I can change the heart of a man in a day. Come on, get over the smallness of what you're fretting over and accept the fullness of what God has already spoken into your life. Look to that star, that star of Bethlehem and see that he had a plan before you had a list. Come on. And right now I, I, I've been a part of that worry. I've been a part of that doubt. I've been a part of that fretting. There's had different times just to be vulnerable with you guys. It is very hard being a lead pastor through a global pandemic, race riots, looting in the city, it's so difficult in this season to be a Christian, let alone be a lead pastor. And there have been days where I've looked at my schedule and all the appointments and all the meetings and we're trying to care for people, giving money in every direction to try to help serve the needs of our community and everyone around us, where I have ended my day completely exhausted, fell out on the bed and woke up in the morning and said, God, I don't even know if I can actually make it through this day. I don't know if I have another word of encouragement. Many of you know me and have come to know me through a daily broadcast where I prepare an hour long teaching every day. And there's been days where I'm like, God, I'm gonna come crawling into that broadcast because the seven hours of work that happens before noon is already more than I thought I could do. But I'm here to tell you, it's those moments where I say, I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. I'm fixing my eyes. I wanna speak to the men. It is hard to be a man in this era. Jesus had an assignment on his life to be killed. I believe that many of our men are feeling depression. There's an inadequacy that all men feel because we are judged by our ability to provide. And then it's not even culturally acceptable to tell another man he's doing a good job. So men very rarely hear the, the phrase, you're doing a good job. And it's never enough nowadays. And, you know, three or four decades ago, you used to be able to pay off your college while you were in it with a part-time job. And now we're buried under the weight of student loans and, and we're trying to father our children and we're trying to parent, we're trying to love, we're trying to, we're trying to, the single men who are watching are trying to do right by God's standard for their purity, but their brain has been hijacked by pornography and, and, and Hollywood and an industry that's monetized their sexual desires and made billions of dollars off of perversion them and Christ was born to break every curse off of this generation of men and that star that that the whole world is calling the Bethlehem star the star of Christmas is shining bright to declare the freedom of every man watching this broadcast the first Adam fell before there was a phone <laughs> the first Adam fell before there was internet the first Adam fell, but the second Adam said, I will not fail and I will be true to the cross. He didn't stay a baby. He wasn't murdered as a baby because his destiny was to go all the way to that cross as the second Adam so that you can live free. I wanna to speak to the women who are watching this broadcast right now. Like Mary, who gave birth to a baby that had an assignment of murder on it before he even became the fullness of what God had destined. Some of you, how am I gonna take care of my kids, Pastor Mike? It's not enough. I get the messages every day in our text community. We are praying for you, we're believing for breakthrough, but we have this fear, this palpable fear. How do I survive this season? I'm just so alone, Pastor Mike. Face it the same way I do. I fix my focus on that Christmas star. I fix my focus on him. I say, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm trusting you that you didn't get me this far just to get me this far. You're gonna take me all the way. I wanna read this scripture to you. Psalm chapter 121, verse one through eight. And this is a, a text that I quote very often. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? And it's a question mark. Where does my help come from? Does it come from that man that said he loved me but left me? Does it come from my employer who said that I was the best employee ever and then furloughed me during a pandemic? Where does my help come from? 
My help comes from the Lord for whom heaven and earth he made. He will not let your foot be moved. He keeps you and he will not slumber. He doesn't sleep. He, no matter what time zone you watch V1 services in, he never sleeps or never slumbers and he's watching you. He is your keeper. The Lord is at, he's your shade on your right hand. The, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil and he will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and the Lord will keep you in from this time forth. And it says this, and forevermore. Come on, I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for you because as you're on this faith journey, they left their country these wise men with whatever gifts they had by faith. And they took a journey to a foreign land. Some of you, you might not be changing your physical address, but your emotional address is changing. Come on, did somebody hear me? You, you might not be changing your physical, but you're going into another country like a wise man. Your emotional address is changing. I'm not going to be weak. I am gonna be strong through Christ. I am not gonna to bow to the spirit of fear. Some of you are not changing your physical address, but you're changing your mental address. You're going into another country like a wise person and saying, God, I'm gonna to travel to this place that maybe my family never got. I'm gonna to travel to this place because I know that Jesus is waiting for me in this other country. He's waiting for me in this mental and emotional and spiritual destination that maybe no one that I know has ever traveled to before. And there's wisdom in walking into another path. Come on, do I have anybody like that? Any people that are watching live who say, I'm trusting that God's gonna keep me. I'm trusting that he's gonna keep me on this journey in my coming and in my going in whatever season of life I'm in. And I'm gonna give like I trust. I'm gonna worship, enjoy, and celebrate like I trust. Come on, let me pray over you right now. I just feel such a tremendous peace. Do you guys feel that? Like something is supernaturally transacting in this moment. Some of you watching may even begin to respond with tears. Some of you may begin to respond with crying. Some of you may even laugh because there's a supernatural joy that's saying, <laughs> I didn't make it this far to make it this far. I'm going all the way. I'm gonna have joy in the midst of this. But I want you to do something all around the world. I want you to step outside your front door. Come on, in South Africa, in London, in Tacoma, Washington, in Florida. Come on, in Ecuador, in the Dominican Republic, all of our global family. I want you to step out and I hope you get a cloudless sky to see the star of Bethlehem that hasn't aligned in the last 800 years since the dark ages. And now God saw it fit that in your lifetime, he would remind you that the savior saved the world. If you wanna accept that savior, if you wanna renew your commitment to that savior, I want you to say these words with me and they're just gonna lift up some worship to him. And we're gonna do what they did 2000 years ago we're gonna do what they did 800 years ago in the dark ages, and we're gonna do it right now. We're gonna worship him. Just say these words, Heavenly Father, I receive the Savior, Jesus. Wash me clean by your blood. Make me new, and I rest in your protection. I rest in your provision. Come on, just say those words. I rest in your provision. I am yours, and you are mine and I worship you with my life in Jesus' name. Come on, you feel that peace? Come on, just say amen. Come on, let's just worship.